So welcome everybody to this third session on sustainable heating technologies. It's going to be delivered by uh, Marcus Baker of Africus New Zealand Eco Energy. Um, welcome to everybody. Um, I have just also seen some emails identifying that some of the links to the previous presentations um, have not been operable. Um, I've got some replacement links which are, I will circulate out again um, at the end of this session today to you all. Um, and also I'll keep you informed of when the permanent links are up and available as well. Um, but just before we get into the content of the session, I'd just like to share a couple of slides with you and we'll soon be into Marcus's presentation. Um, so just for SIBSI members, I know some of you um, are probably aware of this additional seminar series that began yesterday. Um, it was running for five different sessions uh, over lunchtime periods. Um, if you've missed the first one, that's okay. You can still join in on any of the following up sessions. So yesterday's was a really insightful one about looking uh, forward to a resilient future. Um, and so had some really interesting insights from the insurance industry and well building institute and also uh, control so um, thoroughly recommend those um, also um, we are um, have a, an awards event taking place now on the 18th of november fingers crossed that that will be in in person um, has been delayed already but and may well be again but we're hoping it will be in person um, if not in person, there'll be an online version of it where we can actually see uh, the presentations of the winners of the Young Engineers Awards and, and also share the celebrations with them. Um, if you're not a SIBSI member and you're uh, interested in gaining all the advantages that uh, that membership can provide for you, um, you can become a SIBSI affiliate. Um, and currently there's an offer on that you can get 18 months subscription for the price of two and that URL code in the bottom corner will help take you to uh, the application for that. Um, and i um, confident that you'll find that uh, uh, a valuable membership with access to a huge amount of technical information. Um, also have to acknowledge Connexus, who's a recruitment organisation who is the sponsor for all of our uh, technical sessions and I'd just like to run a short video for uh, for you to uh, to watch um, outlining what they offer. Right, so thank you for that uh, attention during that introduction. I'd like now to pass over to Marcus, who's going to take us through the remainder of the technical session. Cool, thanks, Roger. I'll just um, get my screen going. So, can you see the title page? Yes, I can see that fine. Cool, all right, let's see if everyone else can. Um, so we, we just do things slightly differently today um, in that <clears throat> I'd like to workshop some bits of it at the end, uh, but by all means stop and ask questions going through and um, we can bring you up just because I think, you know, for practical implementation, it is so varying. So I'm only going to be able to do overview uh, type you know, recommendations or advice and information. Um, and so if we 
have any people present who've got any specific projects or even just an example project and, and then we can workshop it a bit then then please do do that so we jump straight in for integration with building design um and i've just again tried to keep this quite high level um but specific to pellet boilers because of course there's all sorts of different aspects when we're looking at a heating system or a domestic hot water system for a commercial building but just for the um, consideration as a pellet boiler we're going to need to think about plant space they're bigger than gas boilers which would be our main displacement um, and also bigger than coal boilers we need to store fuel um, so just like a, a, a coal storage um, you, you require you know, the solid fuel it requires storage rather than gas which comes down a pipe um, we're going to have to manage fuel delivery um, it's pretty easy with pellets, but it's something to be considered as part of the integration of the building design. And yeah, this applies equally for retro and new build. Um, system heat load and design, we'll, we'll look at that a bit more. For renewables, they tend to be more capital intensive than fossil fuel boilers. And so getting the, the heat loading accurate um, and specifying the correct size of system becomes more pertinent than maybe just a, a bigger is better approach with with fossil fuels um, and the fluing as well it's you know a, a small but but important consideration so in terms of boiler room space last week we looked at how you can deliver pellet fuel systems and that tends to be up to about 200 kilowatts or more or less 250 maybe at the most are the biggest off the shelf pellet boilers um, before you start getting up into half or, or maybe multi megawatt custom made ones. Um, but for the standard commercial offering, we're going to be cascading multiples of smaller ones. And so um, thinking about you know, how we lay it out, the, the, the nice thing about a cascade is that you can dot them around a bit more. You can be more flexible about that placement. It doesn't just have to be one hulking unit um, in a specific spot. Um, ideally, we'd have the pellet store and the boilers in the same space, but it, it's not absolute and we'll, we'll go into that. And the distance um, to the pellet delivery connection point. Um, so I just provided a little example here. Um, this is from uh, a Norman Disney Young design for uh, a retirement village. And um, here we've got a 128 kilowatt Aquafen boiler, and then the flu is just going to go out through the, the rear wall. Um, have a bend um, and then it goes up that, that this is a, a services cavity a void um, that will go up six stories to the roof and this is a basement level um, and we'll look at this as a project example a few times and then in here you can see I think this is a, a thousand litre buffer as much just for hydraulic separation as anything else because we've got multiple loads at multiple temperatures coming off and then this will be a couple of um, I think 1500 litre or possibly 1200 litre uh, domestic hot water cylinders with um, decent sized coils in them. So you've got uh, separation with the potable and the non potable. And then also coming off here will be um, heating to a pool and a spa. And I think we're even providing some heat into the HVAC system. Um, but just gives you an idea, it's, it's not a huge space and we're, we're able to get plenty of energy in there. So just looking at that, I'm, I'm going to use Aquafin as an example, but they are more or less much of a muchness in terms of size once we get to these capacities. Um, so 130 kilowatt Aquafin boilers, two and a half meters wide, it's just under two meters tall, and it's about 1100 deep. So then you've also got some clearances to bear in mind. They're pretty tight. They're not based on temperature. They're based on servicing. Because we've got a controller, on the boiler, we've got wires actually running all the way round and through um, inside the, the, the at, between the, the casing and the insulation jacket. And we've got you know, motors and augers and all sorts of electrical stuff that doesn't really appreciate getting hot. The outside of the boiler is not hot. And therefore these clearances are really just minimums for allowing a bit of access for working. So if we look at the space required, including clearances for 128 kilowatts, it's about 2.2 by 3.1. And so in theory, 
you can just push them you know as close together as possible just having the minimum clearance around each one and get half a meg for 4.4 by 6.3 meters which so you know a bit more than 24 20 25 26 square meters it's not a great deal of space and and you've got a half a megawatt of output that doesn't include the pellet store um so just to give you a worked example this is from uh, a college and this is looking at it plan view and so we've got 128 kilowatts here another 128 kilowatts there the flues are slightly offset um it, it, they ended up actually having to bending them so they were straight but anyway it, it you know that they're as tight as can be um and so there we've got 3.4 by 2.6 giving us 256 kilowatts so it doesn't have to be ridiculously um large to to get you know some really quite significant outputs um and then with the pellet store just to recap we saw there's a couple of different options we've got things like a flex silo from walker and, and there's other companies a couple that do a, a bag system and then we've also got a um a pellet store where just bear in mind that for every auger you generally have a sloping floor. I know there are some other systems out there, agitators and um, moles and various suction spots, but the, I think the consensus is that the most reliable system is a dedicated auger um, with a slope because everything's on your side um, as much as it can be. And we always need to leave a bit of um, airspace at the top here for the um, uh, breathing room and, and for delivery. So it's usually about 200 mil. So you lose some space, essentially is what I'm saying with the sloping floors. Um, and so just to give you an example here, again, this is from the, the same project with NDY. We've got two eight ton Aquafen flex silos. So two of these units, each one holds eight tons. We've got 16 tons in total. And we're in a little wee room that they've created in the this is basement level two, so we're at ground level, so we're bearing straight onto ground for the structural bearing and the weight loading. Um, and it's just been the fire engineer was quite happy to just say, okay, well, long if you put a wall here, um, so it's its own little wee fire cell and doors, then I'm more than happy for, for all this to be stored in. And these yellow pipes are the delivery and the extraction, which we'll look at in a sec. But again, so just under four meters to just under six meters and we've got 16 tons of storage and 16 tons gives us oh my calculator is hiding hang on a sec 16 81 and a half megawatt hours of um of heat energy which is plenty so one ton of pellets is about one and a half cube and it's 5.1 megawatt hours. So for round numbers for you to you know, do your own workings. Um, and just recapping, we want vertical more than width because we've got these sloping sides. So obviously it makes a lot more sense to go a bit higher than to go a lot wider. Um, and with multiple boilers, you will often have multiple augers. Um, so that can help sort of, you can have a, a sawtooth profile here rather than having big high slopes. Um, and so our store size is going to be dependent, of course, on space, um, also on the heat loads and the daily pellet consumption, because there's no point um, having a massive store if they're not going to go through that much, which is what we see in schools quite a lot. Um, but then on the flip side, if we've got quite high consumption, we need to be thinking about a bigger store to make sure there's resilience and we're not having to have trucks going there every week or you know, whatever it is, or ideally not going there every week. Um, and so also then the, the truck capacity and the frequency of delivery comes into it. And so just to give you again round numbers, generally a vacuum truck will be holding 15 tonnes or 23 cube. Then you can go up, you know, work that through with the, the megawatts. And a truck and trailer is about 30 tonnes, 46 cube. You can go less than that, of course, but um, the most and and 15 is probably the maximum i know nature's flame truck in the north islands 12 tons for example and their truck and trailer i think is 26 possibly 28 um but the, you, you to get economy of delivery we want to try and have the truck as full as possible for that customer 
Um, although there is sharing going on and as the network increases of boilers that are out there, we're going to get more economies of, of, of a network delivery and just picking up a, a smaller amount each time, potentially dropping off, I should say. Um, and obviously something that's really important factor, there has to be some residual pellets. We can't, you know, take it right down to the wire um, because no pellets, no heat. Um, no domestic hot water. So we usually leave a, a residue of a, a ton or, or two in the bottom of the hopper before delivery happens. Um, and just in terms of how they transferred, I, I'm a big fan of vacuum. I mean, <laughs> vacuum is maybe a misnomer, blower truck is maybe a better description. Um, it's the international preferred method. Um, it reduces risk of damage to the pellets and, and um, also vacuum pellet transfer between the, the store and the boiler as well. That's, you know, so, so we're both gonna blow it into the, the store and we're gonna blow stroke suck it from the store to the boiler. And um, that's where you, know, you really don't want to break down in, in um, pellets and break down in the plant. It also gives us a lot of flexibility um, over the distance and obstacles. The standard onboard transfer system would normally be 25 meters between your pellet store and your boiler and we can go through walls and around obstructions and bridge fire cells with fire protection collars that close up automatically in case of temperature so there really shouldn't be any reason um, that we can't get between a to b um, and we'll just look at how we can go beyond 25 meters at, at some point going forward but just to recap and we saw this slide before but just to recap um it's, this is the the designs that i saw that we saw a minute ago from ndy where we've got two 18 ton stores in the sub basement one and then about 20 meters away are the 120 kilowatt boiler in the, the plant room and then flowing up and then another 20 meters this direction goes up to the delivery point and so ndy's beautiful little model shows it quite nicely we've got a hundred mil pipe that's this is essentially going to street level so so the the bin um and and laundry um delivery bay um and that will be obviously all fixed and, and a nice little box in the wall that's tidy and hidden away and it will also have an indicator so that when the the flex silos are full a little light comes on here to say stop delivering or not full it'll probably it'll be a little bit less than full so that that all the pellets in the pipe work can be blown out. And so just to be really clear, there will not be pellets in this pipe when the delivery ceases. So the truck turns up, their first job will be to blow air through the pipe, and then they'll turn on the delivery mechanism and pellets will be blown through, and then they'll turn off the delivery mechanism, but continue blowing air through. So all of this is, is voided of, of, of pellets. Um, and that will be a hundred mil metal pipe that's all fixed in place and hidden in walls and et cetera. Um, and then from the flex silos, we've got a flow and return. So these are 60 millimeter plastic hoses with um, anti-static windings on them. And as you can see, they're going around a few corners and up and down and da da da. And they will have one with air being blown from the boiler. And then as it passes through the head of the of the pellet delivery system, pellets get dropped in and then they get blown back to the boiler. So another way of housing this all are in what are called energy boxes. So a containerized system. I think these are hugely appealing for especially retrofit um, buildings. Um, it's a containerized pellet boiler plant room with all the systems and components required so you've got your boiler or boilers in this instance that's just a single 64 but you know, you'll see that multiple you've got some form of fuel storage and an automatic fuel supply system so there's an auger in the bottom here and then our pellet transfer system um, and you've got delivery points here so that the pellets will be blown in there's a little mat here which deflects them and stops them smashing themselves to pieces and, and eroding the wall behind them. Um, equally, delivery could come straight through from the, the entrance here. We, you know, we can port it however we want. Um, and then it's simply a case of providing service connections 
to the container and you get a really high level of cost control because we can tell you exactly how much the whole plant room is going to cost and then it's just a case of putting a pad down running the flue up and providing service connections there's also a consistency of design and delivery so um, especially in an you know, emerging new market you're going to have a lot of companies who who won't have done these boilers before let's, let's be realistic um, but we would provide for example the 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 package of containerized system that's pre-commissioned and then the site installers just need to uh, plug services onto it so you're, you're separating out if, 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 if you feel there's any risk around the contractors that are being used um, this is a way of, of mitigating that risk by separating out the very um, specialist knowledge around pellet boilers from the more general knowledge of hydraulic systems um, workmanship flexible site placement is obvious with a, a container it's a lot easier to move water and power around than um, anything else. And they're also modular and expandable. So if we just have a look at these modules, so uh, here's an example of a 128 kilowatt energy box in a single 20 foot high cube container. So for those not familiar, that's 2.4 meters wide, six long, 2.7 tall. And we've got a boiler and then about seven ton of pellet store on this side. So it's an isometric view and um, you can see it, um, you've got double auger so you, you lose a bit of space because you're going to have a slope up and then another slope down to a sort of v-shape and then a little bit of slope on either side but you, you're really maximizing the space by having the two augers as opposed to a central one where, where you lose actually considerable amount of space with the, the slopes going to either side um, and there's an access hatch um, delivery through this pipe here so it would generally be delivered by someone just coming up to the to the front door because we're we're assuming you're going to have to get in but we could equally put a, a delivery point at the rear um and everything's nice and tidily included in the same thing and we've got about 36 megawatts of megawatt hours of um fuel store in here when it's full and then we can just keep on going up so this is 256 kilowatts we're now into two 20 foot containers we've got our boiler plant room and we've got a dedicated pellet store um, either with four or two augers depending on the, the arrangement of, um, in here uh, and, and cost preference but we can get up to at least 20 20 21 tons of pellets in this container so that does become a more significant load we just need to have a think about the bearing on the ground but we've now got over 100 megawatt hours of store so we've really you know got a good good amount of storage here the containers can then be end to end side by side or on top of each other on top's going to add some cost um, and you'd actually have the boilers on top of the pellets most likely because of the weight ratio um, but you know then you're going to have steps and blah, blah blah but it's all eminently doable and you could just use a 20 foot container for pellet storage it's something we're going to look at in a minute um, they can be up to 25 meters just using a standard on boiler suction system from where the boilers are placed and um, so then you can reduce your footprint inside the building and you've got a, a large low cost um, high capacity weatherproof store that um, just gets plugged in essentially and um, they can blend in with surroundings this is a 40 foot energy box in austria and so they've wanted to clad it in the same uh, as the building and, and so to keep it consistent or make a statement you know put something on the outside which is demonstrating this organization's commitment to climate change and that the active um, role that they're playing put it put a truth window in or even a fake truth window where you have a you know a little box of pellets in it um and yeah i i think there's enormous marketing benefit actually to companies uh, doing this and um, that they could get a lot more outcomes from it than just the, the, the delivery of, of the service of heat. So if we just move on to multi-storey buildings, um, I've mentioned that um, 25 metres is our standard for on-boiler pellet transfer, but there's ways of us managing it in other ways. Um, and obviously there's a lot of multi-storey buildings out there and they often, I think particularly a retrofit, they're going to have high plant rooms that maybe haven't necessarily been thought about particularly for decarbonisation at all. 
um, and there's a limit on structural capacity up in those upper stories. Um, and we often have high temperature water systems that are set up there. So heat pumps might be challenged by those conditions. Um, we'd always want to start off with energy efficiency and system control to reduce our heat loading and, and to lower those peaks. But um, if we're going to do it with pellet boilers, uh, smaller ones are probably easier to get in to service lifts and arranging plant rooms. When I say small, I still mean modules of 64 kilowatts from the Ocfen context and, and other sizes from other supplies, mm -hmm. but is that they can then move through the building much more easily than a, a, a you know, half megawatt or 700 kilowatt unit trying to be placed inside the building. Um, and let's have a look at some um, uh, site-specific conveying systems um, where we separate it out. So I've just got an example here from Massey University's Albany campus, which we've designed for them. Um, you've got Spanish mission style buildings with ceramic tile roofs. And um, in this example, there's the library, which is six stories. And this section here that you, you can see right at the top of the building, that's where the HVAC and gas boiler plant room is. It's, it's an absolute pigging nightmare, but like the access to it is up a ladder and it's got about six, 700 kilowatts of boiler capacity in there. And yeah, you're not getting anything in there except if it goes up through the service lift and then there's a hatch and your, um, um, uh, there's a gantry to, to, to hoist it up. Um, but the issue of course, is that with 600 kilowatts or so of load, that's a significant amount of pellets and we can't blow them through the standard delivery truck up to here. And, and even if we could, you know, the many tons of pellets you'd want to have on hand for use wouldn't be conducive to a six story plant room when you start talking to the structural guys. So we've designed in a system with 640 kilowatts of boilers in this rooftop plant room made up of five pairs of one, five lots of 128 which breaks down to actually 1064s for getting them physically up here, because that, that's a significant challenge all, all, all on its own. And then delivering the pellets, we put a bulk store here at ground level. I mean, it could be anywhere, but this was just a bit of dead ground. And then an underground delivery pipe, which pops up just outside and beside the building. And then there's a, uh, a fire um, escape stairwell and services um, point in the back here that comes all the way up to the top story. And that's also where your uh, fire hydrant risers are. So we've already got three big ass um, pipes that are taking fire water up to the, all through the building. We just put a fourth pipe next to it and they would be conveying pellets and then that would disappear up into the ceiling, track across above some bathrooms and then into the pellet store. So your bulk store would be at ground level. This would be you know, 20 tons potentially, or it could be more, could be a 40 foot container. You could have 40 tons in there. Um, the truck turns up and plugs into that and delivers into there very nice and easy, just like picking up a rubbish bin. Um, so no more disruption than that to the building. Um, and then there'll be a bespoke air conveyed system that's designed and built by a New Zealand specialist in air conveying. And that would gently waft, would probably be the best description, the pellets up to a bulk store. And so we'd have a, a small one ton or so pellet store basically as big as we can get away with for the structural guys so that we got you know ma maximum resilience up in the plant room um but that would be our, our kind of day hopper you could call it and then they transfer in the, in the completely standard way to each uh boiler so so if we just look in in the plant room there's already this huge hvac system that takes up a good two-thirds it's, it's maybe not quite scale but it takes a good two-thirds of the room up here um, and there's some other tanks and various things up and um, 
we just demolish a small partition wall that's that currently the gas boilers are all wall hung and they're in here and you know they're lovely and small and tidy but they're burning a fossil fuel which is contributing to the climate crisis so it's something that we need to resolve and these five 128 boilers moved um put around the, the space and then they would just have the standard pellet delivery from the bulk store and this bulk store would have the air conveying system now um we, we've been doing a lot of deal design on this and the air conveying system is is going to be absolutely fine to deliver to this uh store that the, the, they said that pellets are easy for them to transport um that their most challenging product yet was twisties they're this company that did the air conveying of twisties from one side of the factory to the other and they said you know if you want a product that's really going to break apart if you treat it too roughly twisties is is a good example so they're very much used to getting the correct airflow balance so you're floating the pellets up to this store rather than smashing them to pieces on the way it's all just about very careful um flow dynamic design i'm sure eddie's um uh, experience with that type of work um so that's it for plant room design if we just have a quick look at hydraulic design um questions to ask really is whether that that boiler that's required is uh, or that specifies is going to need a buffer we looked at that last session some of the designs of pellet boilers do require a buffer to manage their thermal inertia um how quickly um, will the boiler respond um and therefore we're going to have to have greater thermal storage if, if they're not particularly responsive or if we've got very very peaky demand because um in general pellet systems biomass doesn't cope particularly well with very very peaky um demand it, it, it'd be better if we can smooth it off a bit um and how variable are the temperatures um and therefore you know the, the size of the buffering and and um whether it's whether whether we're getting into the right efficiency point um and just bear in mind that, that they're always slower than gas boilers um we're always going to have to have some degree of hydraulic separation so that the boiler pumps um are not drive are not being driven by the main circulation pump it, it, it may be a case that that the boiler pump can do it but it's unlikely in, in a commercial context um and of course the, the boilers have got steel um water jackets and so it's dosed or, or, or at the very least it's black water um that, that shouldn't be being renewed and so it needs to be separated from domestic hot water potable water um something about controls pellet boilers have got really sophisticated controls often um but in my opinion it should be optional about whether or not they're doing more than just managing the combustion on the boiler so you can you know the ocafen boilers for example and plenty of the other ones will do all sorts of high fluting system design uh, sorry system management so complete system management but and i, I really emphasize but the hydraulic design would then have to match that control logic and design principle of the boiler it's really important to understand if we start mixing and matching using a kind of new zealand approach to our hydraulic design and then expecting the boiler to provide the control system you're almost certainly going to have minor to very major headaches over commissioning and system operation because european heat sink system designs is often quite different and it might not suit our conditions and our expectations and our designs and maintenance um my preference um it's only a preference but um maybe as strong as a recommendation is that the boiler control manages the combustion on the boiler and then they do that you know there's a lot of actually quite complicated stuff that goes on that side and it needs to do it um and then it just meets a target temperature at some point of hydraulic separation so be that a buffer or heat exchanger or just a simple hydraulic separator and then the demand management controls are outside the scope and integrates in the bms or in other some other system but the boiler is essentially blind to where its heat is going because otherwise 
if the boiler's in control, it's going to need to be completely in control. And you'll need to really understand very well how that control logic works. Um, the fluing, the, the fan forced and the variable speed control. Um, the mission, somebody asked about particulate matter, size and type. Um, that will probably be um, addressed here. So um, the, the, the controls and the emissions will vary depending on boiler manufacturer. But as you pointed out in your question, Daryl, they're, they're pretty much all from Austria, one from Switzerland of the examples that I found. And so they all have to meet the European requirements. Um, so I, I wouldn't suspect any would, would have any issues in this country. We've just got very uh, difficult to prove um, particular levels at times because of the, not because of the boilers, but because as usual, the way that we've um, legislated. Um, and so under the um, national environmental standards for air quality, regional authorities have to demonstrate that they're not exceeding limits for the entire airshed over the entire year. So then getting that down to the really granular of individual boilers can become quite complicated. Um, the flue does need to clear obstructions um, to, to avoid backwash. Um, generally, they're going to be insulated. Um, it, it's very practical to have multi-storey flues for, for tall buildings with low level plant room like we saw at, the, um, uh, at that project. Um, that, all right, that's only six stories, but I don't see why you couldn't go 20 stories. You just have to have um, some baffling and velocity control to, to, to reduce the draft uh, because we want the boiler ultimately to be in control of the draft through the flue and not for it just to be sucked um, willy nilly. And we manifold multiple boilers in, in a larger single flue. So that's me for the session. One thing I did want to show you, I'll just jump out of this. Hopefully you can see my uh, screen still. Um, yeah, you can see, your, see your, yep. uh, your calculation sheets now. Yeah? So Wonderful, okay. So I've, I've, we made up a bit of a, a calculator tool to, to help do rough ups. Um, this is available on the Eco Hot Water website. And I just thought I'd show you what, what's available to, to, to help you with roughs. Um, it, it's a bit easier with domestic hot water, but there is a, a heating calculator at the bottom. Um, so anything in yellow, you can enter data in and greens give you um, outputs. So we can put in how many liters of domestic hot water a day. They're used just normalized to 60. Um, there's a, actually a domestic hot water demand estimator because it's not always people that haven't done much renewable work um, it might necessarily be that familiar with um, daily use. It's you know when we deal with fossil fuels, all they care about is peaks, peaky, 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 peaky. But with fossil but renewables, we want to know a bit more about what's the demand profile going to be over the day, so that we can smooth it out a bit. So there's a, a domestic hot water demand estimated using ASHRAE figures. NZGBC figures for offices. Um, travel points have a really big impact on, on shower usage. Um, and then if you've just got raw energy use, there's a, a calculator for, for working it back through litres a, a year, litres a day at 60. Um, so if we just put in 10,000 litres a day, let's say it's over 12 hours and 50% of it is used in two hours, then we know our peaky load is about two and a half thousand liters. And the indicative is that one 64 kilowatt boiler um, will be fine, but as, as it says here, you might want more for redundancy and about 3000 liters. Now these are rough estimates, but it gives you a, a good idea. And I think really important is, well, there's a live uh, fuel comparison calculator over here. Um, so you can see, you know, if we increase that 15,000, all the numbers change. And it gives you the CO2 emissions of it using pellets, natural gas, LPG, 
electricity, a heat pump with a COP of three, um, diesel and coal. And you can see that the compared to pellets, um, there's a pretty significant CO2 burden. And, and if we go back to our first session, that's because pellets are made out of a waste. So essentially all of the carbon uh, uh, that's, that's stored in the pellets as heat energy or uh, as potential heat energy is free carbon. It, the carbon has already been accounted for. And you could argue about you know, whether that's just or not, but we have accounting principles in carbon, just like we have for finance and their internationally agreed norms. And that is how pellets come out in this country according to those norms. And so essentially the embedded carbon is only for the transport and the manufacturing of them, which is very, very low. Um, we've also got some estimated cost here. Um, I, it'd be interesting to update these actually, because uh, over here we've got the data sources um, and I've got here in here natural gas at five cents. Now we're seeing commercial customers being told that their new gas contracts are 11 cents. Um, this is all locked, I'm afraid, so you, you can't change it. But um, you, know, you could work it out reasonably easily and maybe the next update will, will go up to 11 cents. And so natural gas currently at five cents is a lot cheaper. At 11 cents, it's gonna be a lot more expensive. Um, so that's an interesting dynamic that's coming out pretty fast. Um, so boilers, peak output, recovery time of the buffer from cold uh, energy in the buffer. Um, what we reckon it would be a month. They, they, they again, just averaged out, these aren't exact, but also then how many tons of pellets would be required a month. And you can choose, look, if you've got bugger all room, this is how much space it's going to take up. And this is how frequently the delivery, the, the time between deliveries. Whereas if you can give a bit more room, um, we can, uh, we've got a footprint here of how much pellet store it's going to take up, what it's going to store, uh, sorry, annual fuel use, what we're going to store and, and therefore how frequently. So now we've got three months between, between deliveries. So you see, it, it makes quite a big difference. It's small. We'd have to have delivery every less than every month. Uh, medium every month and a half and large every three months and large still not that big it's only 14 square meters I know our mates in the architecture business will freak out that we've taken another cupboard off them but um, that's the price you pay for combating climate change um, and then an estimation of the cost uh, this is probably gonna have to go up it hasn't been reviewed for like six or nine months um, and everything's gone up in the last six to nine months frankly uh, what the total floor area is going to be. So for our boilers, for our buffers, for our pellet store. So now I've got two cupboards off our mates. They're really grumpy. Um, and then if you want, there's a basic heating system one. This is a bit harder to specify because it's so varying, but let's just say we had a thousand square meter building and it had a heat load of 70 watts a square meter. Um, you can always enter your heat load if you want. Then we reckon that that should be managed quite easily by two Bokofen 264 kilowatt boilers. Um, and then you can go back up and, and look at the other bits. That's me. Um, maybe we can do a bit of workshopping for the remainder of time. Um, if anyone would like to, to bring up any questions or ideas and thoughts. Marcus, I'd just like to start with a question about the estimated annual running costs and how you went back to the natural gas. Yes. Just checking, was my memory from the very first presentation that your pellet cost is likely to be fixed or can be fixed for a number of years? That's right, yeah. So what have I put it in here at? I've put it in at eight cents a kilowatt, so $400 a ton. So it's probably a bit small. Uh, $400 a tonne or eight cents a kilowatt, and that could be fixed for up to 15 years in our current. Uh, when I say fixed, there is an inflationary aspect to that. So it won't be eight cents in 15 years. Yeah. But you know, the inflationary aspect is like two and a half, three percent. So and, and inflation is just what, yeah, that's what it is. All right. Yeah. And if any anybody would like to propose what the natural gas and electricity prices will be in 15 years it'll be brave, yeah they'll be brave people yeah that's it good luck yeah um, and i forgot there's also a servicing calculator in here as well which um you input how many boilers are on site 
and how many tons of pellets because the the number of running hours is impacted by the, the volume of pellets that goes through um so you know if you only had two boilers but you're running through a thousand tons of pellets we'd want to be servicing them a lot more than if they're running through 100 tons of pellets um what price of carbon in the cost calculators, Rob? No price of carbon, because um, you could always work it back out through here because you've got your CO2 emissions for each fuel type per year. And so you could add that on as a burden. I've assumed that um, for the fossil fuels, that price is going to end up embedded in the cost per kilowatt cost per cube cost per you know whatever however it's bought gigajoule so um yeah i haven't um factored that i guess i could add a box maybe maybe it'd be a useful one just to point it out because at, at the moment i think we're up at like nearly 40 bucks a ton maybe even more um it, it, it's interesting that it doesn't for, for commercial jobs when we're talking commercial buildings carbon pricing isn't as big a factor as i'd like it to be you've got to be up at like 200 dollars a ton before it starts really hurting um fossil fuels 60 dollars a ton now thanks rob would make a big difference yes i mean what um if we just let's just take um gas so 60 dollars 60 tons it's still only three thousand six hundred dollars a year but you know that is that's still yeah that's reasonably significant I, I have been assuming that for 11 cents a kilowatt hour for gas that that includes the carbon factor um so you know, it just depends on where you put your money for the calculation um just to go back to the servicing calculator the other thing is that um yeah anything in yellow can be adapted and we've also got two different boxes here we've got uh, where standard site, where domestic hot water is not a critical service, so maybe you know a non-medical site, and so you could take out both boilers at once and, and not worry too much. For example, if there's more than one boiler, um, but other ones where you've got only a boiler per visit because you really, you know, you absolutely have to have the redundancy, um, then then you've got a, a higher cost of servicing, but it's still not bad. So I've got a question in the chat there from Nicholas. Um, this goes back to the first presentation, but <clears throat> how do we ensure that pellets are only made from waste? Anecdotal evidence suggests that they chip whole trees when demand requires. Um, anecdotal from what country, I guess, would be really critical to, to understand because there's absolutely no way in this country, and, and Rob might be able to back up on this. I, I'll tell you what, Roger, could we just unmute like everybody so that we can have yep. a bit more of a discussion? Yep, happily do that. Um, I think I can do that. Yeah, Rob, you're the chair of the Wood Energy uh, on the Bioenergy. Oh, hang on, everyone's just coming through now at some point. Yeah. I think you probably need to unmute yourselves uh, on your own off your own back yeah so that you're um, now allowed to speak <laughs> rob rob would you mind just speaking to this one please and just introduce yourself yep can you can you hear me yep, yes we, we can. can hear you okay cool yeah no there's a lot of misinformation around about that but as you say marcus it's not going to happen in new zealand it happens a lot in america where um mainly driven by drax actually a big power station in yorkshire who use about 2 million tons of pellets, I think, currently. Um, so they've set up pelletizing operations in the south of, south of America, where there's a lot of uh, excess fiber, to be honest. Um, I certainly would never champion whole tree chipping, but it does seem to be happening, and it's sort of giving the uh, a bit of a bad image. Uh, and that's all for power generation <clears throat> in the UK, predominantly. And just for context, Rob's the chair of the Wood Energy um group and the bioenergy association so hopefully he's got a reasonable understanding does that answer your question or concern was it daryl no nick yep got a yes yeah. awesome thanks and and a lot of that's just down to pure economics especially in this country um we might 
have something different happening at some point in the very distant future. But um, log prices being what they are, that it would it would be economic suicide for a company to do that in this country. Um, Daryl, did you want to say something? Last question or anything? If anyone else has got anything they want to raise or ask, or you know, we can discuss about design, about application of these, then, then please do. So Marcus, just focusing on the calculator, you say yeah. is that's available on to... the ecohotwater.co.nz website. So right. under the OpenFen tab, um, calculators, or, or get in touch with me. We've got one for solar thermal as well um, that does a similar kind of role where you look at um, solar thermals more about cost savings and efficiency, whereas pellets is just complete straight displacement of um, energy. So you, you might not have hard data on this, but the, the, the move to pellet boilers, has that uh, been accelerating in recent years or has it been a steady transition over a over a longer period. I'm, I'm talking about people converting from fossil fuels to pellet boilers. Um, again, I wouldn't mind deferring if I can to Rob, you've probably got a better, I know what we're doing, but I don't necessarily know um, the entire industry. Sorry, Roger, ask that again. I got temporarily distracted, embarrassingly. <laughs> no, that's all right. I'm, I'm wondering whether the, um, the prevalence of using pellet boilers is um, is accelerating quickly over a short period of time, or whether it's uh, a gradual growth over a number of years. If you're talking about in New Zealand, um, yes, yeah, New Zealand. I think it's about to take off big time, mainly driven by the government's procurement policies, which are at last catching up with where they should be. Um, in particular, on the education side of things, they're trying to convert all schools pretty well. They've got a current tranche of about 100 schools out for conversion and. Pellets do suit schools very well. Um, a lot of those schools are in the South Island. They're on coal currently, so they're used to having a solid fuel. Um, but th those that aren't are maybe on LPG or, or diesel. So they're already used to storing a fuel on site because there's no natural gas down there or no reticulated mm -hmm. gas. Yep. Um, so, yeah, it's picking up uh, nicely. The momentum's picking up. Uh, wood chip, we, in I don't install boilers anymore, but we did install six wood chip boilers at schools. And I have to say, that was a uh, part of a, a learning program, I guess, instigated by the government. And a, a key learning really is that chip is not that well suited to schools. It can be, it's more cost effective typically, but um, even that's sort of questionable when you look at this, the uh, modifications to a fuel store or a brand new fuel store for wood chip. Um, so yeah, no, it's building nicely and pellets definitely have their place in these heating sectors. Um, all them, a lot of buildings in Europe are heated with pellets, and we really should be pushing along for that. So good to see that work at Massey as well, Marcus. Mm, yeah, well, that, that's. I mean, that's not a. Yeah, it's not been agreed, but that that's a proposed system. I, th I think for me, the the opportunity that pellet has to replace fossil fuels in these small to medium applications is, is really huge because it they, it's quite difficult, and heat pumps are definitely going to be part of that solution. But yeah, you know, it kind of nothing beats setting something on fire and having 70, 80 degree water yeah you know, delivered on on demand. Um, I, think, I do yeah. think from a wood wood energy perspective, I guess going into bat for for the sector I specialize in, but um, you know when when people compare heat pumps, even with as you, as you say there, Marcus in front in that table heat pump with COP of three. Um, if you look at the full life cycle costs, the, the wood pellet boiler will last 20, 25, 30 years with a bit of refurbishment, maybe a bit of refractory or whatever it is. Whereas a heat pump needs totally replacing, often within 10 years. And I've heard of s examples where significantly less. So you look at the full life cycle costings, <clears throat> heat pumps may look cheaper to run um, and arguably are easy to install, but um, the full, Full life cycle costing, I think, pellet boilers win out. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, Daryl's asked about wood chips from Australia. Um, nothing that I know of, and, and all, all pellets. The, the only pellets coming over from Australia are um, uh, ones for food, so so 
um, smoking. So there's a sort of small industry for uh, pellet smokers, um, kind of like a wood barbecue, but, but using pellets. And you want to use nicer wood for that. You don't, you don't want to have pine pellets for smoking. That'd <laughs> be quite unpleasant. Um, so there's some of that coming over. But no, I wouldn't have thought chip would come over from Australia. The, the economics of it and the carbon burden wouldn't wouldn't make any sense. The chips, you, you've got to keep even closer to, to shore. New Zealand actually at the moment is a net exporter of pellets. I mean, that, that probably because we don't import very much at all. But the, the, the bagged product goes to Korea and Japan to the premium um, domestic market. Um, no worries, Daryl. If, if, if there's anything else you want to ask, just, just let us know. Um, and, but the, as we looked at in the first session, even all of the wood waste converted into pellets or, or, or other forms of biomass will easily be soaked up with all of our thermal loads in this country. Um, I had an interesting conversation with um, the Jonathan Pooch from DETA a while ago, and we were discussing wood waste. And he said that just one of the Fonterra plants in the South Island would be able to absorb all of the calorific value in the wood waste we currently send to landfill. Um, th th that's the municipal managed landfill, so about a quarter of a million tonnes a year. There's another million or so tonnes that, that goes to uncertified um, landfills. So there's, there's a lot of waste out there that could be helpfully used as fuel instead of being just shoved back into a hole in the ground and therefore displacing fossil fuels. Thanks, David. See ya. Okay. I think we're all good, aren't we? Yes, I think we've just, yeah, just past one thirty. So um, if there's no more questions, I'd just like to thank you, Marcus, for three very, very detailed sessions over the last three weeks. It's been fantastic cool. um, information. Um, it's really shifted uh, thinking from, uh, from, from wood burning appliances being stick another log on the fire. It's come a long way from that. Yeah. And, and, and with some precision and control and some environmental credentials. And I think, um, are warranting a much, much closer look by many of our services engineers over the, over the next period. So thank you very much indeed for your time and the detailed presentations. And just to uh, the attendees, thank you very much for, uh, for coming along. Um, we will make sure that this presentation is available to you either streaming from the SIBSI website or as a download. Um, and I will also send you connections for the ones that you may have been finding difficulties on downloading as well. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much again. And uh, maybe look forward to seeing you in future presentations. Um, and uh, look after yourselves during the rest of the lockdown. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs>